So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to my talk, um, which I'm going to start off with this incredibly important graphic image, which I suspect by now many of you are familiar with. After COP26, with its somewhat equivocal results, which may well put us, if we're not very careful, onto uh, considerably higher than 1.5 degrees C global warming. Uh, we are at risk of 2.4 or worse, depending on what happens over the next 12 months or so. Um, this image is really underpinning the philosophy of my talk and the urgency of the situation we're in, both within London and globally. And one of the reasons I like to make this talk is because in the context of climate change and environmental change as a whole, we often tend to think about environmental change as being something that is about our agricultural systems or the polar ice caps or rainforests or important grasslands. We tend to not very often think as a society about the impacts of climate change in the urban and suburban environment. So, um, what I'm really going to focus on is talking about London and how looking at London and the data that members of the London Natural History Society and other organisations have collected and the predecessor organisations have collected over the last 300 or so years, we can start to build up an understanding of how London's environment is changing, how that is important to us if we are people living in London, but also how this information is important globally because urban areas we know increasingly are in many ways uh, canaries in the coal mine. They provide us with some form of predicting what could well happen in the wider landscape. And also we know they're immensely important in the context of uh, invasive species. Many invasive species start their biological invasion in urban landscapes. They adapt and evolve in those landscapes and then move further afield. So understanding how plant communities change in a city like London is incredibly important for us globally in terms of tackling these challenges. But it's also fair to say that we're not in a position at the moment where we've done the really granular science to be able to unpick these patterns and put very high confidence levels, for example, as we call them in science, and say absolutely these changes in London's flora are down to environmental change or are they down to other aspects of change in our environment or changes in people's habits or the organisms that live in our city? So unpicking what these factors are is still essentially a matter of opinion in many respects or a bit of, you know, kind of looking at background data and information and logic. So much of what I say is pretty much coloured, coloured rather, frankly, by my personal views, which is extraordinary because London is such an important city. We should be globally using it as an exemplar, for example, along with many other cities of how we can understand how climate change is going to affect us in the future. So this talk is going to be pulling on data that has been collected through the activities of London Natural History Society, but membership organisations as well, such as the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Oh, I just noticed I've got the old logo up there. Society of the British Isles, that's very naughty. That should be the Society of Britain and Ireland. That's the old official title for the organisation. And this data is also compiled and organised within the Greater London area by our local biological records centre, Green Space Information for Greater London. Now, many of you are very familiar with this image. Many of you are actively involved in recording plants or invertebrates or fungi for that matter in the Greater London area. So you'll have an understanding of this, but I suspect some of you will not be familiar with this curious map in front of you. So what this map presents is the diverse community of interests, knowledge and expertise and activity that overlays the, overlays the current Greater London area and, and those of us who collect information in the area. So the red outline we can see right in the middle is the current boundary for the modern Greater London, the city of Greater London. The historic city of London originally started off really in this little nub in the middle here and gradually expanded through the 19th century. 
Now, behind this red line of the current Greater London area, we also then have this large circle. And this is the recording area of the London Natural History Society, which is often turned into diagrammatic form as a polygon, which you will see much more of later on through this talk. Now, the recording that London Natural History Society does in Greater London and the adjoining counties also in itself overlies other activities, principally the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. So each one of these unnamed and anonymous geographic areas are the vice counties system that we use today. So this area that covers much of North and West Greater London is my vice county. This is the vice county of Middlesex, the no longer functional extant county. And these, these then overlap with the other adjoining vice counties. So this is the county of Surrey, this is West Kent and East Kent is over there. And these recording units have been in existence since the mid 19th century. And that stability of recording on a national scale is one of the reasons that Britain and Ireland are such powerful tools for helping understand change in the environment because of this long history of recording biodiversity in our islands. So there's a complex pattern, it's fair to say, in the Greater London area of who records what and where and how. And we do our best to compile and collate and collaborate with each other to ensure the data gets to the right place. And these data actually underpin not only our endeavours creating works such as this, but they also underpin information such as conservation status, whether something's considered at risk of extinction, or legislative frameworks to do with planning, et cetera, et cetera. So the amateur natural history activity of recording information about our natural world has quite significant economic and cultural impacts and environmental impacts in our society. So the, the backbone and the core of what we do in many ways, as in my case as a vice county recorder, is by compiling floras. These are accounts of the plants known to occur in any geographic area. So in my case, I'm terribly lucky in for the county of Middlesex that I have predecessor or pre um, recording um, uh, floras for my county. Most places in Britain have got a long history of people creating, oh naughty me, of creating, creating um, floras for their geographic areas. So in the case of Middlesex, we have uh, Dougie Kent's flora work that goes through from the 70s up until the early 2000s. And you will have heard momentarily Rodney Burton speak to me. Uh, and Rodney Burton is my direct predecessor in this historic sort of continuity that we have of recording plants. And these floras are full of data about where plants were found, but also their status. So it's not only just point locations about where something is, but qualitative information about how a plant is doing in many cases. So this information is incredibly valuable for understanding change in our environment. And the most recent iteration of a sort of full flora that covers the time that we that I will be start talking about is this particular, this is Rodney Burton's Flora of the London Area. And this was a book um, produced and edited and compiled by him on the back of and through driven through the activities of the London Natural History Society's amateur recorders through the 60s and early 70s. And this work is pretty much to this day still very, very relevant, despite being published far back as the 1980s. Now, one of the things about a county flora is on average, they take well over 20 years to produce. These are long thought through, constructed and data compiled activities. They are a lot of work. Coming back to the comments I just made a little bit earlier on, but this, flora and this mapping exercise will form the basis of what I'm going to be talking about in many respects. So this is the outer cover. It's fair to say that this landscape is a landscape which no longer exists. Greater London has lost this particular piece of urban brownfield space. It's now got a city hall and lots of smart uh, granite and um, slate all over it. Um, but what we will be concentrating on are these distributional maps. This is the LNHS polygon which show us where plants were known to occur 
in the 60s and into the mid 70s. And this one here very clearly, for example, tells us this is actually a the band of chalk that forms the southern area of the London Natural History Society area because this is a plant that requires and prefers calcareous chalky soils. So maps can tell us a lot about the preferences and the ecological desires, so to speak, about many of our wild plants. But it's fair to say that the urban environment is so mixed up in many respects, it can be quite hard to unpick the underlying geology, such as calcareous soils. So it's fair to say that London, like many, many other urban areas, has gone through a very, very long period of decline of its native or um, um, ancient flora. So we have two terms that we use to describe non-native plants in British botany these days, and one of which is a archaeophyte. So these are non-native plants that have been in our landscape for a very, very long time and are almost honorific natives, so to speak. Such things as poppy or common mallow. These are such abundant and widespread species that we think of as native, but they're actually um, human introductions. So both archaeophytes and naturally dispersed plants, which are the natives, such as these two species, have gradually declined over the last 400 years as urbanisation has occurred. So such plants as this marsh south thistle, one of my favourite plants that many people have heard me talk about over the year, used to be locally frequent through what is the core of urban Greater London now. It was scattered through areas such as what is now the Isle of Dogs or what is now the urbanised area of the Isle of Dogs and parts of East London. This is a species which has now been entirely wiped out through the act of embankment, making the Thames faster and tighter and putting concrete walls in and turning low-lying grazing marsh and marshy areas into the city we know today. So many of our native and non-established non-natives have um, essentially been removed from the landscape through these processes. Others have seen their landscape and habitats remain but change. Such plants as bell heather as a, was at one time, if you recall, look at early floras going back into the 18th and early 19th century, were locally frequent in various parts of what we now know as modern day Greater London, the adjoining areas. But this is a species which has suffered and its relatives have suffered an enormous decline in abundance. So places such as Hampstead Heath are no longer the heathlands that we once knew. If you read accounts of Hampstead Heath in the 17th and early 18th century and before, this is a landscape that was dominated by heather, gorse, grassland plants are associated that with open pasture, wood pasture with sheep and such grazing. And Hampstead Heath is most definitely a profoundly different landscape. Most of these plants that require and love nutrient poor environments have declined and have passed into history. Others, such as this woodland plant, this is the May lily, Maiglichen, has become extinct in the Hampstead area completely and utterly. This was always a very, very rare plant in Britain. In fact, there's a dispute as to whether this was indeed a wild plant in the Hampstead area. It may have been an ancient, accidental, or purposeful horticultural introduction. So we have seen profound change in our heathland and woodland plants, plants such as wood anemone, persist in certain parts of Greater London, but in many cases these plants are quietly biding time as they gradually glide into extinction, because many of London's woodland areas are frankly in suboptimal conditions, and whilst they may have populations of wood and enemy, they're not doing very well, and many of them are being adversely impacted by heavy footfall from humanity, and also from nitrogen pollution in the form of cars, airplanes, dogs, etc., etc. So many of these plants are still with us, but they are frankly suffering uh, death by a thousand cuts, so to speak. So we have the ancient landscapes, we have the wonderful woods of Epping Forest where there's beaches, or the fantastic pasture and oak woodlands of places like Richmond Park with this fantastic veteran tree. But the infrastructure and the diversity within them is to varying degrees. And we've just heard very interestingly how um, the, um, some of the fungi are doing relatively well in there. 
many of the floral elements of this, the vascular plants, are doing less well as they compete with the activities of humans and increasingly in some areas, non-native invasive species. So we are seeing um, London's kind of ancient landscapes are gradually becoming more and more stripped down in their plant diversity. Now, so this is an example of actually how this is happening and we're possibly not really seeing it very clearly. So this is Mercurialis perennis. This is uh, the map. I'm just going to do something momentarily. I just need to move out. Oh, that's better. So Mercurialis perennis is dog's mercury. This is a widespread plant of woodlands, ancient woodlands and old hedgerows. Uh, and this is a, a nice example, I believe, of how we can look at historic data to start to understand how things may well be changing. So mercury is a broadly considered nationally to be doing quite well, quite a successful species. This map on the right hand side is from Burton's Flora, published in 1983. The map on the left is data that I've pulled out and derived from the national database, of the BSBI. And these records go up to the current day, well actually up to the end of 2020. So these are all records in the whole of Greater London, the adjoining area, and there are 4,500 or plus observations of this plant in this area made primarily by the amateur natural history community over the last few hundred years. This is the total observable data that we've got so far that's in the national database. There is more data to come in because of various ways that we need to transcribe historic literature, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but it's a pretty good snapshot of what the total distribution of this plant is. And you can see from here that comparing the two maps, that broadly speaking, it looks fairly similar. There's a little bit potentially, if you know, increased records in some areas, but it's, it's essentially more or less the same. Some of this may be in some cases in these central London locations where small populations have been observed and recorded or possibly purposeful introductions because it is occasionally planted when people are doing habitat restoration, although it's fair to say not very often. Now, when you look at the data in more detail, you start to actually see how actually there's something more complex and profound going on. So when you break up the data into date cohorts, you can see that potentially things are not looking so good in the London area for this apparently nationally successful plant. So again, what you've got here are all records, but I've changed the colour on them slightly. So on this one on the left, the ones that are post-1970 are in dark. These light ones are pre-1970 and they are lighter. So you can see even for 1970, there's a loss in many respects pre-1970 reflecting the late Victorian and mid 20th century expansion of Greater London into in particular the county or former county of Middlesex. So ancient woodlands are being cut down, hedgerows are being cleared, etc, cetera, etc cetera, through that time period. Now what I think is really concerning is that we would have believed with the stabilisation of London's landscape that that loss should have pretty much kind of plateaued. However, if we look at the same principle for post 2000, we are seeing quite significant losses that are continuing through particularly much of the northern half of Greater London, but also to a certain extent in the southern part of Greater London, outside of the chalky area of the Deep South. So this does seem to show that actually this is a species which is going through a fairly gradual and probably overlooked decline through much of the Greater London area. Now the causes for this we don't know, but I strongly suspect it's habitat degradation, fragmentation, and bit by bit things like trampling, etc, etc. And this is a woodland plant. So the changes that we're seeing in the London area are often actually potentially quite subtle and overlooked. Now this next example is actually of Campanula rotundifolia, harebell, one of our most celebrated wild plants. And again here I've got a map with the total records for the whole region, over a thousand of them. And this is a species that within recorded history, so the last 
200 plus years or so, has generally been considered broadly pretty uncommon over much of the greater London area, particularly north of the River Thames. Nationally, up until relatively recently, this was considered a common plant, but it appears to be going through quite a catastrophic decline over much of lowland England, and has been listed as potentially a risk of extinction if it continues in the way that it is going on, an, on a national scale within England. Thankfully, populations in uh, Ireland and Wales and Scotland are doing better, but the picture in England is broadly pretty dreadful for this species. Much of this is likely to do with pollution impacts as well as direct habitat because Campanula rotundifolia is a small plant. It doesn't tolerate competition. Um, it likes relatively nutrient poor soils and things like nitrogen fertilizer and all of the industrial and agricultural and vehicle pollutants we put in the in form of nitrogen mean that species that like that, such as nettles and coarse grasses, coxfoot, ryegrass, etc., are out competing this species. So this plant has never been common in the London area. But again, you can see that by looking at this data, you can see that we've seen a pretty major drop in the number of records compared to the overall. I strongly suspect that some of these records in the urban area may be errors for horticultural introductions or maybe short term introductions that people have done for temporary activities. So many of these records, I suspect, may turn out to be either inaccurate or not stable populations. Some of them will be long term survivors, however. So there's been a significant decline for this species. And one of the things about the data that we collect is that it is very, very fine grained. So when you look at these big blocks here, this big block doesn't tell you that it is found all over Ilford. What it's telling you is that it's found in Ilford, but in a very small area potentially. So I'm just drilling down here. This is the south as far southwest. And if you look down here in the far southwest, you can see in many cases, we're actually dealing with very, very small patches of environment where these plants are occurring. And many of these individual dots are quite likely to be single clones, which are hanging on in the landscape and potentially not doing very well. So even further afield in Southern England, in the less impacted parts of the London Natural History Society's area of interest, we are seeing plant species actually in quite severe trouble. Now, I always have to talk about London Rocket because it's such a wonderful story, but it exemplifies again, you know, about behaviour and human activity and how it impacts upon our city's plant diversity. London Rocket is so named because it's intimately linked with the history of our city and one of the most important events in this city, which is the Great Fire of London. This plant is a non-native species. It was actually recorded before the Great Fire in the London area, but was always a sort of rare curiosity. After the fire, it became incredibly abundant through the burn sites and was recorded in many areas and so much so that it's noted by the likes of Samuel Pepys in his diaries. Over the next three or 300 years or so, this species went into a pretty steady and gradual decline. So by the end of the Victorian era, it was often recorded as being very rare or extinct over much of what we now consider to be modern Greater London. Interestingly, this species, probably about 30 to 40 years ago, started reappearing in some of its old haunts, particularly in the east of London. And that pace has picked up quite drastically in the last 15 or 20 years, where it's being found to becoming considerably more abundant in parts of the East End and is starting to turn up in new locations. Um, and this is of import, and I will be talking about this idea much more, because this is essentially a plant of Mediterranean habitats and it is thriving in the heat island bubble of Greater London, with that additional background heat from environmental change. So this is a species which is a warm climate, relatively warm climate species, which has um, probably held out at low ebb in the London area as well, populations, but the recent warming in our city has increased its abundance significantly. But curiously, there are actually at least two different colour forms growing in our city. There's a form in Islington, which is a different colour to the ones that are in East End. 
And I strongly suspect that these colour forms relate to different introduction events over the last 100 years or so. So we're seeing quite a complex pattern potentially of long term survival in parts of the East End and around the Tower of London with augmentations from new sources in the 20th and 21st century, which I will come back to a little bit later on. So we talked about one great event in our city. Now we'll talk about the other key fundamental part of our city's history, which had massively affected our urban plant diversity. And that was, of course, the Blitz. And this was such an important event in the history of London, but also in the history of the London Natural History Society, that actually a series of publications and studies of bomb sites were carried out. And here's a picture taken from one of the studies. And also herbarium specimens were collected as documenting parts of these fundamental changes in our flora, because plants such as Rose Bay Willow Herb, which had previously been uncommon, rare or very scarce throughout Greater London, became very, very successful in this newly created habitat that became available to them in much the same way as the Great Fire created new landscape for uh, London Rocket a couple of hundred years previously. So London developed this brownfield landscape and habitat as it was, we've, we came to know it as. This is a habitat and landscape which has gradually, gradually been lost through urbanisation and some of the plant species that were successful in these habitats are now appearing to decline. Not Rose Bay Willow Herb, it seems to have skipped into a new landscape and has become a fundamentally important part of our railways. But some other species do seem to be not doing so well. So this is an exemplar of, you know, these tiny remnants of what a, you know, a a brownfield site or a bomb site derived habitat would have do, do look like where they're increasingly rarely found. These are several incredibly common and widespread urban plants of the London area and they're very much Londoners but none of them are native plants in the definition I've given you. Each one of these are introductions through human activity. So common mallow in the background and mugwort are both ancient introductions, they are archaeophytes, they were introduced through our Neolithic ancestors agricultural activities over the last few thousand years. Hirschfeldia, this yellow plant here on the left hand side, is now London's most successful uh, member of the cabbage family, particularly in the inner London area. And this is a species which with a much, much more recent introduction, I can't remember the exact data when it was first recorded in the London area, but broadly speaking, this is a plant which has made London its home since the era of um, the Blitz and has continued to be widespread in new habitats that it has found. So again, looking at the data, you can see actually how even for many years after World War II into the era of the Lennon NHS recording in the 60s and 70s on this map on the right hand side, it remained a relatively scarce plant of the Thames corridor. You can pick up the hint of the River Thames um, winding through here and also the urbanised parts of the East End and the heavily affected bombsite areas. Now, again, if you look at the maps for today, in that period between the 1970s and now, we've got several thousand records have come in because this plant species has gone through an explosive range increase in the Greater London area and is moving out quite rapidly into the suburban and semi-suburban uh, um, quasi-wider landscape environment of southeast England. Hirschfeldia is a European native plant. It probably would have got here if it hadn't been for things like the last series of ice ages, um, but is definitely a species which has become very well established and is actually um, ecologically probably really quite important, although I'm not aware of any studies from an entomology point of view about its benefits but being a member of the cabbage family, I expect it's quite valuable. Conversely, you can look at plants such as Budlia, you know, one of our most widespread and familiar urban plants across vast ways of Britain and Ireland. And what I find extraordinary about this is when I talk to people, many people believe this is a, an ancient introduction, it's been with us for hundreds of years, or that it is native. The first wild record of Budlia 
in the London area was in West London in 1927. So in less than 100 years, this species has gone from being widespread in urban areas, as exemplified by Burton's flora, to widespread pretty much everywhere. Now, this is quite a significant range expansion, and also it's a huge expansion in abundance and movement into diverse habitats. This is a species which really does potentially threaten um, our the biodiversity in the future. As to whether this is caused by climate change or gradual adaptation and evolution, because we know that non-native species can evolve quite rapidly, we don't really know, but I suspect it's probably active evolution. But again, you can get, you can play with the data and look in a little bit more depth and see what's going on. So despite this great spread of diversity, uh, Budlia davidii, you can see by the dark dots in the middle, is very much still at its most abundant in terms of records and observations in the core and the heart of urban Greater London, despite being widespread across the rest of the region. So we're seeing non-native species expand and adapt very rapidly at the moment, but we're also seeing plants which are native species, which historically over the last 200 years were doing very, very badly, are actually recolonizing many areas. And I saw we have John Edgington here. So John, forgive me if I paraphrase this terribly. John Edgington has done a lot of research on the history of our wall ferns, such as this maidenhair spleenwort, and how they have managed to recover ground or find new habitat in the London area over the last 40 years or so. So maidenhair split weren't along with other relatives is very intolerant of sulfur pollution and other forms of atmospheric pollution, probably particulates as well. So by the end of the 19th century, this as a species and its relatives was very rare or more or less extinct in much of Greater London. So much so that in the era of Rodney Burton's flora, you can see that the core of Greater London, the most urbanised area, is devoid of records. And what we have seen since then is a shift because you can see these outer ones are the sort of slightly cleaner areas, possibly a bit of a bias to the west where it is even slightly cleaner of surviving in these cleaner area landscapes. Over the last 20, 30 plus years, we've seen a really major movement of this species and relatives back into the core of urban area of London, because that is because modern London is a great habitat for this species. Lots of walls of all sorts of different ages, lots of substrates emulating its natural habitat of cliff face rocks and et cetera, et cetera. So once pollution in the form of nitrogen and particulates, well, rather sulfur and particulates removed, this is a species which has done very well. So we're seeing fern species that used to occur here recolonized, but almost certainly on the back of climate change, we are seeing fern species which never used to grow here moving into the Greater London area. Both of these are extremely rare still in the Greater London, but they have been found in the last decade or so by people like John and other ex excellent pteridologists starting to turn up in Greater London. And both of these plants prior to the era of human induced climate change were essentially at the northern edge of their range. They're very much Mediterranean environment like in plants, very much at the northern edge of their range in the far west of England and parts of Western Ireland and Western Wales. These were plants that were deeply and are deeply intolerant of frost. So the fact that these can now establish in the warmer, most central parts of London tells us that inner London, its environment is changing quite dramatically. These are not species that have been introduced by horticulture. They're not really grown, despite their great beauty, particularly for this spleen wort here. And in the case of Asplenium marinum, they're extremely difficult to grow. These have blown here as spores, probably from the far southwest of, of England. So long distance dispersal by spores has finally been able to in, result in establishment because the climate has changed. And the lizard orchid is the classic example within the world of orchids. I suspect some of you may have heard about the discovery of a new orchid species on a green roof 
last year, but the lizard orchid has historically been viewed as on the edge of its European range in southern England, and it has moved north and south as, it's oscillated, as the temperatures have oscillated over the last hundred or so years. Most notably across southern England over the last 20 years, this species is doing nationally very well relative to its historic performance and is being found in new localities and is gradually increasing in abundance in those places where it is known. So much so that for the first time in 300 or more years, a lizard orchid was found in West London. So we're seeing some quite profound changes in the distribution of long established native species such as this. And other species are showing this much, much more profoundly and with a sort of deeper impact on our ecology and environment. So spotted medic uh, is generally considered to be, no, excuse me, a quick sip of water. Spotted medic is considered to be either a native or an ancient introduction or soon I've forgotten. And these are the pre-1900 records for this in the London area. This was a rare, scarce, unusual species. But again, as you move the time forward, the time series, this is 1901 to 1950, you find that this species has become more widespread. These large blocks are at the 10 kilometer square re resolution, as we call it, because historically until relatively recently, most botany records were made at sort of 10 kilometer square resolution. Increasingly now we're trying to record a much, much finer degree of resolution. That's why you've got these smaller squares here. So again, you have to bear in mind, this is not a record where the plant is found across that whole area. It is probably maybe a singleton record in all small patches of it in two or three of these areas. So this is a species which is gradually spreading through the 50s and then into the 1950s and 80s, it really starts to consolidate its abundance and distribution in parts of southeast London and the adjoining area, but also in parts of the Thames Corridor with a couple of other areas. And again, once more into the 2000s or heading into the 2000s, you see greater entrenchment and expansion in this area, and then bang. And this, I think, is one of the things that is really profound about many of the maps I'm looking at. We are seeing patchy distributions, massive change in range. And it's fair to say that, you know, we've not got the resources at the moment, frankly, to do proper scientific studies. But, you know, frankly, a little bit of common sense and observational things is quite likely that this is a climate related thing in many respects. But um, it's ironic that despite the wealth of data we've got about plant distributions in the country, we are pretty resource poor in terms of being able to properly analyze these distributions and what's happening. Now, this is an example which I've been showing for many, many years, and quite a few are probably groaning at this point because you've seen it all too many times. And again, it's, it's reinforcing this story. So the plant at the top is early meadow grass, Poa infirma. And this is a plant species which was only recorded in the wild in Britain, in Britain relatively recently in the 1950s and was considered to be a rare native of far west England in the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. And it was a one of these botanical mecca plants that people will go and visit and pay homage to. It's very closely related to the widespread annual meadow grass. In fact, it's the parents, one of the parent species for this species. Now, annual meadow, sorry, early meadow grass um, is a Mediterranean environment plant. It grows, it, it's an annual, it germinates in the late winter and it grows through the warmer parts of the late winter and into the spring, flowers very, very early. And then as soon as the spring warmth increases, it produces its seeds and is burnt off. So as soon as the temperature rises and the dry ground dries, this is a plant which you cannot find anymore. So it has an active period of you know, three to four months maximum in any given year. This species um, through the 80s and into the 90s started to expand through southwest England. Now, some of that expansion was probably mediated through people getting going on holiday in caravans, probably to the lizard, picking up the seeds on their car wheel arches, etc., on the back of their tow trucks, and then taking it to caravan sites along the south coast of England. <laughs> 
So some of the change of this species has been mediated by humans moving things around in the environment, but it is also being driven by climate change because there's no matter if the climate's wrong, you can move the seed to a new land environment. But if it's too cold, it's too cold. It's not going to reproduce and thrive. So in the very early 2000s, myself and David Bevan, I think we found it new to London within a day or two of each other up in uh, northeast London um, and outside my flat here in Islington. And it remained a scarce plant in the early 2000s of parts of London and the warm coastal, relatively warm coastal areas of, of the Thames Gateway. And once more, not entirely surprising, we've seen this progressive increase in distribution, but also a massive increase in abundance in some areas. This can be locally, seasonally very dominant in suitable habitats throughout the Greater London, whoops, over a shot, London area. So in parts of Islington and central London, this is now a very, very common grass in parts of, you know, in parts of the city. And this is a change in these Mediterranean annual plants that's being picked up not only by this species, but many others, such as Mediterranean nettle, which is a species that was first recorded in 2004 in Warwick, but has now been found in quite a few locations in the London area. Lovely plants such as this fumaria here, but also we're finding long established plants which had gone through decades of decline, such as this common cudweed in the middle. This is a long established plant of our landscape in the greater London area was becoming rarer and rarer and rarer. But over the last five, 10 years or so is gradually becoming more frequent again, because again, this is a Mediterranean environment species. So we're seeing widespread success and advance in many Mediterranean ecosystem plants, such things as this ivy broom rape, which still remains scarce and scattered, but are gradually becoming more and more frequent. And I'm going to skip past this because I'm taking too long because I've been very naughty because I get overexcited as usual. So I've talked a lot about, you know, long established non-natives or native plants changing their behaviour, but we are seeing garden plants do the same at the moment. So these are two long established plants in horticulture in our city. Passion flower, this species, Cairulia, have been grown in England since about the 1680s, 1690s, if not a little bit earlier. Cordyline australis, introduced from New Zealand, has been grown widespread in far southwest of Britain since the mid 19th century, but has become a very, very popular ornamental plant in much of southern England again as the climate warms. Now, some of that has been to do with the fact that in many cases horticulturists tend to underestimate how hardy some of these plants are. I've seen um, Cordyline australis growing in some pretty chilly parts of New Zealand. But a thing that is really starting to happen is this is a species that we are now finding quite regularly self-sown seedlings growing in parts of urban London. And this is partly because there's enough of a population growing in gardens. It is increasingly become a bit of a garden throughout. Gardeners tend to, when the flower spikes are finished and the seeds are set, throw them over their garden wall. Sometimes they end up in the River Thames and I've seen them rafting down the River Thames they get caught up on strand lines, and I've seen this in several locations, of them, and then you see bands of seedlings growing on the strand line. So this is a species which is starting to establish on, on the banks of the River Thames in various places through this shift in human behaviour, but also shift in climate. And passion flower as well, despite being with us for 300 years, is now beginning to jump the garden fence and regenerate in the wild or all of its own. This is one of the classic invasive species changes that is going on that myself and other people are increasingly concerned of. Tree of Heaven has been in British horticulture since the 1760s and for most of that time has been a very well behaved species that rarely produced fruit and seed or not much and even rarer produced seedlings. That has changed very very significantly so in the era of Burton's flora, it was found as the occasional seedling in the urban area was recorded every now and then, but was a rarity to see these seedlings. This has changed greatly in the last 10 to 15 to 20 years, where much of the 
warm urban part of London, this plant is now becoming very, very successful very rapidly and is beginning to outcompete a Budlia and certain railway systems. So it is now becoming a dominant plant on the railway beds and track areas of um, the Waterloo area, for example. This is of considerable concern for all of us because this is a species which has negative impacts for human health potentially, and it is ecologically very, very damaging as well as infrastructurally very damaging. So this is a species which we, if we'd have looked at the botany and the biodiversity decades ago, we could have started to actually make some real predictions about what was going to happen and what actions we should have taken a long time ago. Another subtle change that is happening to the London area, which is on one level not climate change, but is increasingly being made greater by climate change, is the fact that the River Thames is becoming more salty and it is rising and moving westwards. And as a consequence, many plants of salty coastal environments and seaweeds, for example, are migrating further up the River Thames and are being found in areas such as Erith, et cetera, et cetera, where they have never been recorded in the past. And this is partly driven by the geology of southern England sinking, but is also being caused by the southern part of the Northern Sea rising and expanding through thermal expansion from climate change. And this means that saline communities, plant lo saline loving communities are moving further into Greater London. And the data on this is not brilliant as yet, but we are finding very rarely species such as slender hairsia turn up in one or two places where it's never been seen before. This is a plant that really is well adapted to salt marshes and sea aster. This, these images are not brilliant, they are rather equivocal. It looks a little bit like the data is very similar, but we're certainly seeing what appears to be quite a significant consolidation in the distribution of this species in the River Thames area. So the River Thames is changing, it's getting more salty, and that is also being driven by climate change. I just wanted to put these three up because I'm often asking you know, people in urban ecology what things should they be planting in their garden for wildlife. And these are three of the best for us in the Greater London area. But I now want to focus on this species, Eupatorium cannabinum, which is one of my favourite British wild plants. But it also tells us a tale about how we need to be careful about how we interpret maps on their, in their own right. So again, if we look at the mapping data in the historic period, these are early records. Naughty may haven't put this up there. This is from, I think, pre-1910, I think. It would appear to be a very rare plant. And then if you look over to the right, you'll see that this is a species which is relatively widespread, but patchy in its distribution. Unfortunately, this is essentially a data artifact because what data has been moved from historic literature, other pieces of information has not quite made it into our databases. So if you go back to the historic accounts, the qualitative information, you can start to build up a very a, a better understanding of what actually is going on for this plant species. So for example, Gibson's Flora of Essex says quite clearly, you know, broadly speaking, it's uncommon over much of Essex, but in the Halstead area, it's common. Hatfield Forest, it's abundant, but in the Stratford area, it's rare. Whereas Brewer, 19, 1863, frequent throughout the country, and again, the county apologies, which really shows how erroneous this data is at this point. Then if you go to Middlesex, rather rare, and that's probably a thing that could still be said today. This is still a pretty uncommon plant in much of Middlesex, although it's becoming gradually more frequent. Hanbury and Marshall for Kent in 1899, common in all districts. And Burton's flora um, from the 1980s gives a pretty good summation, a fairly common plant, and I put square brackets in some areas. So we have to be careful about interpreting this data and looking at the historic accounts can give us a better understanding of what's going on. And I've just got one or two last final images to show within a national context how profound these changes really are. So round-leaf geranium, here again on the pre-1950, 
has been patchily distributed across southern and central England, always quite scarce. When I first started botanising in the London area, it was certainly in North London, a plant that I would have been very excited to see. Um, but it is fair to say over the last 15 years, it has consolidated and become really quite widespread over much of Greater London. And this pattern has been picked up nationally. This is a plant which has increased hugely across much of England. But even more so, you can see with this other species, water bent, which is often described as one of the most rapidly expanding plant species in Britain and Ireland, that it has gone through a distribution shift that is really quite enormous. Again, pre-1950, this, like some of the other plants I've talked about, is a Mediterranean environment plant. It likes it warm, broadly speaking. It is primarily found in these historic records, areas such as Docklands, warm urban parts of Britain and Ireland. But once more, if you move into the era of rapid environmental change, 2001 to 2021, this species has motored right across our islands in many urban areas. This is one of the most successful street grasses that you will find. So the shifts in our environment have really been both within a London area and nationally really quite profound. So what does the future hold? I think it's fair to say it's going to be very, very hard to predict what our urban plant communities are going to be look like. But one thing I strongly suspect is particularly with trees and shrubs, the ones that are going to succeed are the species which have adapted and evolved to Mediterranean climates. London is in many respects a Mediterranean or quasi-Mediterranean city these days. It's actually pretty warm and mild most of the time now compared to what it used to be. And plants such as holly, olive and their relatives and other Mediterranean basin plants are the things that are going to thrive into the future because they have evolved in these environments that London is rapidly becoming. So I'm now just going to say, you know, ultimately, I couldn't have given this talk without, you know, the knowledge, skills, expertise and enthusiasm of the wonderful members of the London Natural History Society, both past and present. And I thank my predecessor, Rodney Burton, and all of us, those that have gone before us over the last 400 years or so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And so, yeah, that's a nice ending as well to say thank you to all the people, because without all those people making those observations, making those records, we wouldn't have the data to be able to analyse and understand about these changes in our flora. That was an amazing survey of a wide variety of species with very different sort of stories for each. So, uh, I, you know, I particularly liked the fact that we got Poet Infirma in there because it feels like a talk by you would not be quite complete without... I do poem. love it. It's one of my favourites, you know. <laughs> um, but I had not heard the story about the Medicago Arabica and just about that mm. massive expansion. So it is, it is so interesting yeah. to see these diverse yeah. sort of responses to change. Um, we, we don't have a great deal of time left for questions, but I'm going to see if we can pick up a couple of things, if that's OK. Um, so, uh, Anka, do you want to just pick out a couple of things from the chat? We've got lots of people saying thank you. What a great talk and fascinating. And you've even got 11 out of 10. I'm not oh, quite thank sure. thank you. <laughs> well, I'll buy you a drink later or bought a chocolate, whoever that was. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, Anka, have you got just one or two things we could um, pick up? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of questions on data collecting. Mm. So JK was asking, um, do the ca local councils collect and collate data? <laughs> And um, Howard Matthews was wondering, sort of related, how much um, are the changes um, due to increased recording effort? Absolutely. So two really sensible questions in there. So broadly speaking, most of the data for the Greater London area is through amateur activity. There have been contributions in the past on a London level or various local authority levels. So the data is made up from other sources. So there used to be in the Greater London area a thing called the GLA Habitat Survey, which was a rolling programme of data collection. And actually a very good chunk of that data is derived from that rolling programme. So each London borough used to be surveyed approximately once every 10 years. So that actually does form a, a pretty major chunk of the background information. 
sadly, that no longer occurs. The last GLA habitat survey happened, I think, some more time around 2009, 2010, and was then axed. So um, despite having this massive continuity of data historically, um, our, our sort of national and regional infrastructure is not supporting data collection. Definitely record a bias in there. You know, the other question, there is much, and that's one of the reasons I put up that thing about Eupatorium cannabinum, because that shows how, if you're not careful, just looking at dots on a map can lead you to some yeah. er erroneous conclusions. Yes, there's definitely rec there's recorder bias in there. There's data compilation bias and unpicking those in the context of environmental change and other factors such as pollutants, et cetera, et cetera is, is undeniably complicated. Um, and at the moment, there isn't really the resources for this to occur. Mm. Oh, you've, Sorry, I, I, I can't I, hear I, you, Anka, you've gone mute. Muted. I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that. <laughs> that was a bit odd. Um, suddenly I was spotlighting people. Um, so um, do we have time for another question, Maria? I think maybe just one last one, I was thinking. Okay. Um, Kennedy was asking, um, what are the health risks of the invasive um, Elanthus um, altissima? Fair point. So it's an overlooked thing with Elanthus that mainly relates to people physically working with it. Elanthus has been observed to cause nasty scarring and blistering, um, akin to, but not as severe, it would appear, to what giant hogweed does. So there have been cases of tree surgeons working bare chested, which is something I thoroughly recommend. Um, that is causing, you know, when they come into contact with that, um, it causes really nasty scarring. So um, some of a certain, so it's a localized but potentially increasing risk because as Ilanthus becomes a greater, has greater impact on our environment, more people are going to have to do physical management and control because it is really quite a risk to the built environment. So yeah, thank, thank you. And that's obviously something that we, you know, is gonna need amongst all the other things that people need to think about, there's obviously something else that's gonna be need to be borne in mind as well. Now, unfortunately we are already over the one, one minute past, but I can see David waving at me, David Bevan. So do, sorry, do you wanna, yeah, please do uh, unmute yourself and- uh, th thank, you, thank you so much, Maria. I, I just wanted to say what a wonderful talk and, and to thank Mark. Um, very much for, for, for giving it. Um, one little point which has become very clear to me in, in recent times is the effect of climate change and particularly the heat island effect. And we've heard a lot about the Mediterranean and how uh, London's producing lots of uh, echoes of that. But I, I've been noticing a number of uh, disappearance of native plants, mm. I think due to climate change and, yeah. and probably drought. And so for example, I'm giving a cattle eye on Queenswood and in Queenswood, over the last 10 years, we have lost hard fern, great wood rush, and thin spiked wood sedge. And I think that, that, that again, is possibly down to climate yeah. change. I think it is very, very likely that the gradual decline in native and archaeophyte plants in London area has started through urbanisation itself, been exacerbated by pollution, trampling, etc., and is now being speeded up by CO2 driven environmental change. The losses we're seeing in abundance and populations in many habitats of London's native and ancient flora is, is very concerning. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you both. And this is obviously some, uh, something that we could debate further and maybe should be be kind of discussing a lot a lot more so maybe you know thinking about next year possibly thinking about a botany committee discussion um to look at these 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 kind of ideas because um i think you know there is a wealth of data and information out there we need to kind of pull together and then also we need to people need to think about what, what we're going to do what's the risk kind of response to these changes but we're going to have to call it up, you know, put it all to kind of together and to, and to finish off now. But I do want to thank you again, Mark. That was just a really fantastic talk. People have really enjoyed it, learned a lot from it. And I'm sure when it goes onto our YouTube channel, 
it's going to be a popular talk that people will want to follow up. So thank you again for your time and all sharing all your expertise. We really do appreciate it.